Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Near the very end of the Second World War, 100 American prisoners who had been captured during the Battle of the Bulge found themselves locked in a cellar in the outskirts of the German city of Dresden. Now this cellar was not the nicest of places, even as cellars go. It was a slaughterhouse cellar. I can't imagine what it must have smelled like in there. But over four nights, it was much less nice outside that cellar as American and British bombers dropped 3,900 tons, that's 7,800,000 pounds, about seven pounds of high explosives for each person of bombs on the city of Dresden. And those bombs burned Dresden to the ground they incinerated tens of thousands of people and turned a beautiful city into what the author Kurt Vonnegut, who was one of the American prisoners in that cellar, described later as the surface of the moon. Now, as we might expect, there's been a long-standing debate about whether or not that series of bombing raids on Dresden ever should have happened. I mean, was Dresden a legitimate military target? Was it necessary to continue burning cities in Germany with the war so nearly and so obviously won? In a way that's similar to the controversy about the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, opinions are very strong on both sides of this. I'm not gonna decide this morning whether the Dresden raid was legitimate. That's not an answer I have. They didn't really cover that in seminary. <laughs> but whenever I think of this event, I keep coming back to those American prisoners locked in that slaughterhouse cellar. Yes, they were lucky. They survived. But what must it have been like? What must it have been, had been like for them to be absolutely caught in the middle of that terrible firebombing? and Dresden, to on one hand be prisoners of the Nazis in a basement, and on the other to hear night after night the endless thump of bomb explosions dropped on their heads by their own American Army Air Force. I mean, what do you even hope for in the middle of that? That your Nazi captors successfully defend the city against your own nation's bombers? That the raids succeed and somehow bring the end of the war closer? even though it might mean your own death by fire in a basement. I mean, talk about having no good options. Talk about being helplessly and hopelessly trapped between great forces outside of your control. What would we do if we were in a situation like that? What would we do? Well, we actually get a picture, a picture of our choices when we are caught between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, in two of our scripture passages this morning. And the first place we can look to is Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 22. This is on page 588 in the blue Bibles in front of you. Isaiah 28, 14 through 22, page 588. And here's the situation that Isaiah is speaking into. He's speaking to a people not, not trapped in a cellar, but locked up in a city, locked up in the city of Jerusalem. And they are caught, caught between two great powers outside of their control. And one power is the nation of Egypt, and the other is the nation of Assyria, really empires. And neither of these powers care a bit about what happens to Jerusalem or the people in it. They care about fighting each other for the domination of the Middle East. But here's the terrible thing. The terrible thing for, for the people 
and the leaders of Jerusalem. Kind of like those American prisoners locked in that Dresden cellar. They are in the middle of this great battle. You see, Assyria is to the north and east, and Egypt is to the south and west. And guess what's in the middle? <laughs> Jerusalem, Judah. They're in the contested zone. And both Egypt and Assyria would like to control them to better get at the other. So what do the leaders in Jerusalem do? Well, they decide to make a deal with one of those powers, with Egypt. Isaiah sarcastically puts it this way in verse 15. He says, you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, with the land of the dead. We have an agreement. Isn't that interesting? He uses the term Sheol, the land of the dead, for Egypt. Because what do we know about Egypt, right? Mummies, pyramids, a great fixation with death. In other words, even though Egypt doesn't really care about Jerusalem or Judah, the leaders are trying to cut a deal with them. They are basically looking for one powerful enemy to defend them from the other powerful enemy. But Isaiah's message here in chapter 28 to those leaders is that this is not going to work. They have chosen poorly. Look at verse 18. Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge, that's what he calls Assyria, a whip, a scourge, passes through, you will be beaten down by it. In short, sorry, Egypt is not going to protect you from Assyria. Does this mean Isaiah is saying they made a tactical mistake? They should have chosen Assyria, but they accidentally chose Egypt? No, not at all. You see, Jer the Jerusalem leader's fundamental problem is not actually Egypt or Assyria. It's not about trusting one or the other. The problem is that they have forgotten God and they have embraced evil practices. Look at verse 16. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone. And in verse 17, And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail, hail will sweep away a, the refuge of lies. In other words, God is reminding him, I am the foundation of Jerusalem, of any power that you have, any kingdom that you have. And I'm going to reestablish justice and righteousness, and I will sweep away your lies. Now this is clearly something that the Jerusalem leaders have not counted on. They have forgotten about. They have not fulfilled their responsibility to rule with justice and righteousness and in truth. They are between a rock and a hard place here because they had lost track of their true rock, their foundation stone. And the consequences of this sort of choice, this sort of forgetfulness, well, it can be dire. It can be God's judgment, even judgment on his own nation and his own people. So in Isaiah 28, we see that a rock and a hard place situation can sometimes be a judgment. Sometimes it can seem like there are no good choices because there really are not any. Maybe more accurately, because bad choices in the past have caught up with us or with others. Now, maybe we struggle with this idea, or at the very least would rather it not be true. And I don't blame you for that. I don't blame me for that. But at the same time, we've all seen this, right? Maybe in our lives or in the life of someone else, maybe even tragically in the life of someone we love, a family member, a spouse. Poor choices, evil acts, they, they have a way of catching people, don't they? This doesn't always happen, but it often 
happens. Just think of the downfall of Jeffrey Epstein over the last few months. In the end, neither nearly unlimited money. Turned out he wasn't a billionaire. He only had $500 million of wealth. Nor incredibly powerful friends could protect him. I am sure that at the end, he thought he had no good choices left. That he was between a rock and a hard place. And you know what? He was right in some ways. The only good choice he had was repentance, and he didn't take that. But he'd spent his choices in terrible ways for years and years. And it caught up. Isaiah 28, it reminds us, it warns us that, that our choices catching up with us is a possibility, particularly if we get in the habit, like the leaders of Jerusalem did, of ignoring, ignoring the true rock. Ignoring our true foundation, God himself. So we get a sobering word from Isaiah 28. Applied, first of all, to a specific situation in Jerusalem at a specific time. But reminding us as well that there are consequences for forgetting our foundation stone. I'm glad we don't just hear Isaiah 28 this morning. We also said Psalm 46 together. And here we see someone, someone getting it right, so to speak, not paying the consequences of turning away from God, but instead of turning toward him in their rock and a hard place moment. I mean, you just love these words. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help and trouble. And then in verse 2, though the earth be moved, Though the waters rage and swell in verse 3, which kind of sounds like the thunderstorms we've been having lately. And in verse 6, though the nations are in an uproar. Chaos everywhere. But at the heart, the heart of this chaos, that simple phrase in verse 10 of Psalm 46, be still then and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Friends, this is the key to so much in our life, particularly in hard things in our life. We are surrounded, surrounded by things we cannot control, by Egypt's and Assyria's, sometimes even surrounded by what might seem like the thud of bombs raining down from the sky upon us. And we can try to choose a side. We can attempt to master the chaos in our lives through our own power and wisdom and judgment, such as it is. And let's face it, there's a lot, a lot in our culture that pushes us in this way, that tells us that we can control all these things, that we will get the outcomes we want if we just work hard enough and fast enough and long enough. Or we can be still and know God. We can trust him and his purposes in the events that we cannot control. Which, let's face it, is a lot of the events in our lives. And we can look to him for direction in the events that we can influence. There's a quote from a financial author that you may have heard of, a man named Jack Bogle. He founded the Vanguard Group. And he says this, he says, don't just do something, stand there. Don't just do something, stand there. Now, of course, he's talking about investing and the importance of keeping the long term in view at times when the economy seems to be going crazy. But this is actually really good advice in many areas of our lives, particularly when God is concerned. Don't just do something. Stand there. Stand before God. Be still. Trust him to be our refuge and our strength instead of leaning on our own wisdom and our own choices and our own power all the time. Can we do that? Can we take the time, even here in the go-getter capital of the world, 
Northern Virginia, even in the rock and hard place moments in our lives, to stand before God in stillness and quietness, to trust him, to know that he is our true and our only and our final refuge and strength and very present help in trouble. Friends, we all have troubles, but we have a great God who, if we will stand still, stands with us in them. If not, when the bombs are going off all around us, we may get stuck, stuck trying to choose between the Egyptians and the Assyrians. Amen.